Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. My name is Kimberly Cook, and I am the Assistant Director of the Hendricks Center here at DTS. And today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. Uh, We are actually focusing specifically on a book, which we do not do very often. But our very own Michael Spiegel has written a, a book called The AI Theist. Is that how we say it? Mm, yes. yes. <laughs> the, the AI theist. <laughs> and it has several different layers to it um, that we thought were very interesting and very relevant to both theology and culture, which is what we do. And so we are committing a whole podcast to it. So thank you, Dr. Siegel, for the work and for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And, and for the record, he is the, let's see, make sure I say it right, department chair and professor of theological studies here at Dallas Theological Seminary. Correct. And then we are also joined by my boss once more, <laughs> Daryl Bach, the executive director for cultural engagement at the center and senior research professor of New Testament here at DTS. And he also happens to be a world-renowned apologist, which is going to be relevant for our AI theist book. So welcome, Daryl. It's my pleasure. So, Dr. Siegel, for those who have not read the book, Mm -hmm. can you give a brief synopsis of what is involved so that they can be aware and so that I don't step on anything and give away spoilers that you don't want given away? Yeah, we want to try to dance around uh, the twists and turns. Uh, You know, on the cover it says, you know, when an A sentient AI system finds religion, its creator calls on a theologian turned atheist to cure it of its faith. So it's basically um, kind of fleshing out this idea of what happens if uh, an AI system that becomes kind of self-aware decides to embrace religion. Usually, you know, the sci-fi trope is the AI goes mad and tries to kill everybody Mm -hmm. in some way, shape, or form. And I thought, what if we flip that and he is the... Um, the protagonist, the one who embraces religion, and in this case, he embraces Christianity and in its kind of conservative traditional form. And its creator decides uh, it's slowing down the system. He's obsessing over religious things. So he phones a friend, calls in uh, a former theologian that has become an atheist for various reasons, and What ensues is a dialogue back and forth through the chapters uh, of the former theologian trying to convince this computer that Christianity is not true. Mm -hmm. That's the basic story. I don't want to give it away the ending. (laughs) And it's a really good read, just for the record. It's actually a novella. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, hour and a half, two hours, you can work your way through it. And it is it is a very good read. So you can see as Dr. Spiegel walks through the different, I mean, just the plots of the the story that it hits major points. So it has AI, which is very much a culturally relevant conversation right now. It has theology. It has apologetics as an underlying theme throughout. There are a lot of things that are very much of interest to the center, and hopefully you can understand why we're talking about it today. So let's start first with technology. Hmm. So AI, an AI entity, is one of the main characters, and um, that obviously puts its thumb on a cultural conversation (laughs) that is very (laughs) relevant currently with AI, artificial intelligence. Um, So just for the record, for those of you who are listening, we've done a number of podcasts on artificial intelligence, technology, transhumanism, lots of things in that realm. So feel free to uh, go over to those podcasts and to search them on our website uh, if you want to wade into the technicalities. Today, specifically, we're actually going to be looking at and trying to surface um, if it's possible for technology to be an apologetic device Hmm. or an apologetic tool. So uh, in the book, it certainly functions as that. But do we actually see that in the real world? So with technology having that ability. Um, not, yeah, we'll get into lo- lots of things there. So, Daryl, you've done some work in anthropology, transhumanism, artificial re- 
reality, not as, I don't know, artificial intelligence is a part of it, but you've kind of been in that world with Fuzrana, who's also apology, apologist, all of that. What are your thoughts with regard to technology and their role as an apologetic tool? Well, I think we've tended to talk about technology in Christian circles often in a negative kind of way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we need to think about what its potential actually is in terms of helping us. It obviously uh, helps us with all kinds of analysis um, that we engage in, that kind of thing. It has the potential to get us to information very, very quickly. I tell people <laughs> I probably can write uh, four or five times faster than I would otherwise if technology didn't exist. Exist. Uh, my son reminds me I don't have to walk to my study in order to find what I have to look up because of technology. So um, seeing technology not just as negative but as potentially positive, uh, being aware of its limits at the same time is is of value. And I'll just make the side note that if you are interested in what Fuzz Rana and other people had to say, it's voice.dts edu slash table podcast that gets us to that site uh, so that you can see what's on offer there. Or there will be links right below this podcast. That's exactly right, both, (laughs) yeah. Okay, so technology can be positive. Mm -hmm. How can it be an apologetic tool, though? How does it help us represent the faith? Does it? Well, it can certainly help help you find things that represent the faith and mm-hmm. some of the search capabilities that it has and that kind of thing. You know, one of the interesting things is is that the premise of the book is is that uh, AI uh, matures to the point where it's able to make its own self reference and almost becomes uh, almost becomes part of a of the kind of thinking that we do. And I don't know if that result happens in real world or not, but it's an interesting premise to explore and to think about. Uh, so, But there's no doubt that, that technology, because it had, gives us as, uh, access to a vast amount of information, uh, makes available to people at the click and the, right, and the, que- and the questing for the right query um, information that otherwise might not be readily available to you. So, Dr. Siegel, did you do any research into this, or you didn't? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I what did th- some research into just artificial intelligence in general, uh, trying to inform myself on it. And as you know what it was <clears throat> when I was into sci-fi 30, 40 years ago, deep into it, it's totally changed. Mm-hmm. And the, ling- the language itself has changed, and uh, in, in a few years, it's going to be different even then. So things are just changing at such a rapid pace. Um, but I'm with Daryl. I think, number one, the tools that we we have just to do the research first of all mm. to explore an issue you can type in a lot of these um, chat GPT or whatever and ask just the three classic arguments best arguments for the existence of God it's going to give you something it's going to give you a place to start and I think people can use it that way um, but also the fact that pretty much everybody listening or watching this podcast is doing it on some device <laughs> right and the, yeah. the ability to broadcast and the ability to spread um, good and bad <laughs> is a reality that we have to deal with. Um, but we're able to engage with things in real time. Back in the old days, you'd have to wait until you become aware of some problem. Mm-hmm. But by that time, by the time someone's written a book on it, you know, it's festered, right? We can begin to answer things in real time and, and post things and direct people as we've done already in this show. So I think it has uh, promise as well as problems. I also think that there's something to the, I guess, the overall trajectory of technology and what it reveals or could reveal about human fears, Mm. human drivers, you know, that what it is that we're trying to accomplish through Mm -hmm. technology reveals something about what's going on in the human heart. Do you all have any comments there? As far I mean, that helps under at least undergird our apologetic efforts, right? Yeah, it sounds eschatological, you know, mm-hmm. end timesy. People mm-hmm. are going to immediately, and you see it today in media sources. People think about where is this going to be in another twenty, thirty years. Those that sparks conversations. Uh, who's controlling this? And to what end? Now you have questions of how is it programmed? I, how is it programmed? Is it? Is it program? You know, all there's no such thing as neutral programming nowadays. Mm-hmm. There's always some kind of bias. People are putting their thumb on the scale on one side or another. Um, yeah, what 
search results, you know, how are those being filtered? And people talk about algorithms. I don't know what that is. It sounds musical to me, but <laughs> apparently it's bad. Uh, <laughs> right? But all of these things are, are, what are they bringing up? They're bringing up issues of sin, of humanity, of knowledge, awareness, epistemology. How do we know something? How do we know something to be true? Who do you trust? I mean, these are great topics for apologetic conversations. Daryl, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think that the, one of the challenges is that you mentioned algorithms. It always bothers my wife that she goes to buy, buy something, and then in the next five minutes, all these advertisements <laughs> pop up that show where she's been. Exactly. She wants to know who knows, you know, <laughs> and that kind of thing. And so, you know, that uh, people are watching what our habits are, that kind of thing, and what we're drawn to, and uh, and, and so. Th- aspects of that become a challenge but i think the major thing is just the access the you know the overwhelming amount of information that we have access to which raises its own set of problems because sometimes that information is accurate and then sometimes it isn't i mm-hmm. like to tease people it's like rumors that you sometimes hear as fast as the omniscience of god just not as accurate <laughs> and so and when you do that you've got the um, problem of being discerning about what comes across the net as well so it the net is both an opportunity and a challenge, and um, and being aware of that's important in interacting with it. I don't think it's strictly negative. I don't think it's just something that we see. Oh, this is here. Here's our one world reality that's coming in some scenarios of the end times, etc. It actually provides some really important services in the midst of all all those kinds of concerns. Yeah, and I, I also think you know that that. It demonstrates that people fear death, you know, because we're especially in with transhumanism, but mm-hmm. even to a degree, AI and how that interacts with transhumanism in the future. Um, you know, that's it's people trying to live forever, mm-hmm. and it. I guess I'm I'm trying to think of some other ways. It the fear of death. What are some other? And there's another one. Ugh, I'm missing it. Anyway. While you're thinking about that, the yeah. fear of death is dealt with very simply by responding to the gospel. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I can also like a world-renowned gospel <laughs> scholar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Even the, you know, the fear of the future and the unknown. Yeah. And I think in, you know, for me, I, I fall back on my eschatology a lot where someone says, if this does, if we don't do this or if this happens, this is going to happen. And, you know, call me naive, but I'm looking at, you know, you don't even have to get into detailed eschatology. There are just some things that a just a good, healthy, basic eschatology rules out. Mm-hmm. This is a you know not a, pl- a plausible scenario given what we know what Scripture clearly says about um, about the future. So uh, some of those things too will come back to look. There are there's millions of sources of information saying a million different things. Uh, there's something comforting to know that. That God has God's word is, doesn't change, and mm-hmm. He's been saying these same things over and over again. The other thing it does too is um, in the multiplication of sources of information. I've noticed that that is causing people to um, kind of fall back on conversations and personal relationships again. Because mm-hmm. I don't know who to trust, but I know this lady has cared for me. I know this guy has met some needs. I know this person was there when I was going through something, right? Mm -hmm. And you can't Google that. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's something very helpful in the midst of the noise, that calm, steady relationship that can bear some some fruit. Mm -hmm. So shifting a little bit to much murkier water <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> as, it, <laughs> as it relates to AI. And um, as we think through the relationship between artificial intelligence, what we know of it um, now and moving forward mm. and the faith, uh, how do we think about what that is going to look like. Do we need to be preparing to witness to artificial entities? <laughs> what is, does that kind of faith commitment lie outside its domain? What are your all, y'all's thoughts 
on that. <laughs> You're right when you said that was murky. It I told even, you. It so, could even be a I think it's worth talking about. The we worst don't have is, to say that we know what we're talking about. It could be a black hole. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> the, the, the worst is... It, we could be disproven in like a week. I know. So we have to be careful. We don't have to, <laughs> Whatever we, we don't say. actually have to know what we're talking about. We're just clear we're in murky water. Here, here's, here's something. <laughs> what, I, I guess I'm just trying to say, what are some mm-hmm. things for people to be thinking through? Because that is, yeah. I mean, and I mean, they're already talking about AI having feelings mm-hmm. and really yeah. like, the, you know, I think even Fazrana said in one of our podcasts a while ago that it is quickly approaching something that it's hard not to ascribe some kind of sentience like yeah, yeah. sentience and person personality to on some yeah. level and so i think it's a relevant question for mm-hmm. at least us to be talking through how to start to wade in those waters yeah i, I there's several things that come to mind one one that I'm going to start with is, you know, sometimes when you get into these discussions, people get really afraid about what Mm -hmm. could be happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is where the eschatology point you made Mm -hmm. earlier is important, because I think what it says to us is, look, God is very aware of all this. He's been aware of it for a very, very long time. And uh, in that sense, um, God is able to communicate that he is in control of what's going to happen. And I really think a Christian who lives primarily out of fear has wrestled with not understanding the depth of the theology of their identity, and it should be able to remove fear from us uh, and and call us to a faith that trusts God. So that's the first Mm -hmm. thing that I would say. The second thing that I think I would say is, is that as as artificial intelligence becomes, uh, I'll, I'll say it this way, just have a little less artificial and more mm-hmm. intelligent, there you go. okay, um, that uh, it will require us wrestling with, uh, with the relational dimensions that are so central to our faith, and uh, both in terms of understanding, listening, engagement, all those kinds of things. And so I think we need to be prepared for the possibility of, of those kinds of interactions, and it's something that the book in one sense has fun previewing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so there's certainly that element. I also think that it's, it's a challenge in, in, in wrestling with a reality that seems human on the one hand, but isn't on the other. In other words, I would be hard pressed to think that we will ever get to the point, and maybe this is my limited point of view, where um, something that we create uh, reflects the image of God. Hmm. We may it may reflect the presence of creativity. It may reflect all kinds of things, but it won't reflect being made in the image of God. And so, um, so that. That represents the fact that this is something other than being human, and uh, always remembering that is actually pretty important, especially given the fact that we mentioned earlier that the way in which the programming works to set up the kind of entity you would be dealing with is actually a pretty important consideration in thinking about how I interact with whatever it is that's in front of me. So I I definitely agree with you with regard to the distinction of the image of God. And Mm -hmm. I think that is only, anthropologically, I think Mm -hmm. that is only going to be more and more of something that we're having to explore and really firm up (laughs) Mm -hmm. a Christian understanding on moving forward. But I will say, I mean, the rest of creation is not in the image of God, and it is still going to be redeemed. And, and we still have to relate to it, and hope. we have a responsibility to steward it well. The right. original Absolutely. mandate was the call to steward the creation in which God had put us in because he made us, to use the language of Scripture, a little lower than the angels. And I tell people the image of God, at least for me, one aspect of it is is that we're made in the image of God to image God, to reflect his character and who he is and what he's about and the way that he's made us and the creativity that he gives us, the ability to think, to think about what comes down the road, all those kinds of things. Now, it's conceivable that artificial intelligence will develop the ability to do some of this, um, but uh, I'm not sure it will de- uh, develop the ability to do all of it. Mm-hmm. Well, I agree, but I'm just saying even could it be, might it become something that is a part of, I don't want to say creation, because obviously that it there's a... There's a secondary step mm-hmm. of creation, sure. but 
something that would or could be redeemed. I don't know. What do you think, Dr. Spiegel? Well, I mean, it depends on what you mean Again, by redeemed. Again, not equating it with the image of yeah, God. Yeah, it depends on what you mean that. by redeemed. Um, well, I don't know. That, That's but, why I'm throwing it to the... Well, I mean, it, in one sense, um, things can be re- used for redemptive purposes that were could otherwise or were used for, for non-redemptive purposes. So in that sense, it's like any tool mm-hmm. um, that can further our, you know, what I call the, the Imago Dei mission uh, of humanity, what we're called to do, as Daryl mentioned. Um, in that sense, it can be a tool for those purposes, but it can also be used in destructive ways. So I think it's, uh, it, when we stop thinking of it as a tool, as an extension of, of our, our hands and in our minds, uh, then it can become dangerous. And now the next question is, what if it stops thinking about itself as a tool? Is that a possible scenario? It's a, there's a there's a line in the book, and, and I kind of dodge the question to some degree in the end. <laughs> don't actually fully answer it. But uh, the the designer of the machine has asked whether Yar is the name of the machine, whether Yar is actually sentient, or if that's just a a claim, you know, marketing claim. And he pa- pauses and he says. Uh, Yar thinks he's sentient. That's as far as I went, right? Well, if you think you're sentient, are you sentient? Or are you just really, really, really good at faking it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's a, it's a hard question. I, I have a feeling that we're probably very close to the point where uh, we will no longer be able to tell whether we're talking to a real person on the phone when we call customer service or not. I mm-hmm. think we're really close to that. Um, in many cases, I would rather not talk to a real person because the computer's never rude to me. <laughs> you know? I mean, really, they get the job done. I'm but sorry right, you feel this way. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel like we're probably going to get to that point, but that doesn't make the computer self-aware or you know, feeling things like shame or remorse or right. And we're already close to that in some instances. I think about the way – I mean, I'm just thinking about the recent commercials that I've been watching that are about the, uh, uh, about the smartphone mm. in which photographs can be manipulated. Oh. And the situation that doesn't, didn't happen is chronicled as if it did, mm. those kinds of things. And that's – you know, those represent challenges because, yeah. because that opens up the door for all kinds of information manipulation, which is already going on. Yeah. And uh, and that kind of thing. So it's it's a challenge. It's also you know one of the observations I think I have about the book is that the dialogues that take place look like they're pretty human at one level, yeah. you know, in terms of the exchange and the give and give and take that's happening in the retorts that are coming from both sides. I mean, if I were keeping score, uh, I think the human loses <laughs> <laughs> in the book on a regular basis. And so you know, so there are challenges like that. I, and I don't see it as being unrealistic that that might be yeah. in some cases where we're headed. That's why that's why you come to rely on some of the technology that you have because it's able to do things smooth, more smoothly and more quickly than we could do on our own. I mean, some of the mathematical equations that get solved electronically um, took years right. to solve otherwise because there are so many – uh, actions happening in a millisecond. So it's just uh, those are real challenges for us, uh, I think, long term. Hmm. Interesting. So I want to transition from just kind of the murky waters of AI and faith uh, to uh, the the some of the more apologetic mm-hmm. themes, and especially the the underlying ideas that we see is in the book of the questions that the questions that underlie apologetic sure um, conversations and you know the you know it's presented as an intellectual exercise but you know both in the book and it, it seems like in real life oftentimes there mm-hmm. are there are very felt needs what would you all are say are some of those core drivers that may or may not be intellectually grounded. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to flip the script here a little bit and ask this question, which is look at all the effort that's gone in to create artificial intelligence and then ask yourself how did we get here? So, and what I mean by that is 
think about who we are as human beings, the way in which we analyze and discuss and mm. can see and control. And you have a view out there that says, oh, that was just a wonderful coincidence that all that happened. And then think about all the intentionality that goes into creating AI. Mm. And, I, and so I ask myself, so what's the more reasonable expectation? Mm. Is the more reasonable expectation that this just kind of happened and everything just kind of clicked right all along the way? Or is, is there some reason to believe that the reason why intelligence exists is because there was an intelligence that existed? Mm -hmm. um, that kind of a thing. So that's one thing that strikes me about this, about this exercise and mm -hmm. questions it can raise. Yeah, Which is an example of technology as an apologetic tool. Yeah, that's exactly right. Another, argument exactly right. Design, another yeah. form of the argument for yeah. design and yeah. complexity. And, yeah. 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 Dr. Siegel, what do you think is at the core of yeah. many apologetic questions? Yeah, uh, I've been asked many times, you know, what, is, what are the, the themes of the book? Uh, and I would say the main theme is what motivates doubt and what motivates faith. It's Yes, it's facts, and, and there, there's a lot of facts back and forth and arguments back and forth on the existence of God and what constitutes a good argument and did you meet the burden of proof and what about this problem in the Bible? Um, but in the end, all of that kind of crumbles and you realize that for both parties, there's something more than – it's not without the facts, but there's something more than the facts – that uh, the, the image we use in here is the, you know, the, that's putting the thumb on the scale to a certain degree. Everybody does it. We're not just computers, you know, made out of meat. We are thinking, feeling, experiencing, loving uh, creatures of God um, with complex histories. And more than just facts motivate faith as well as doubt. And that's kind of the, I don't want to give away anything mm -hmm. away, but that's kind of part of the, the, the theme. Let me, let me go at it this way, because yeah. I, I know when, when we do our work in the apologetics program, one of the things we have the students read is uh, C.S. Lewis's book on miracles. And in that book, he makes, he makes the point of just ask people where they think thought comes from. Mm. Okay? You, you can't you can't see it, you can't hear it, you can't feel it, you can't taste it, you can't touch it, you know. Um, something's going on that indicates there's another kind of realm that's out there that we have to come to grips with. And um, it's a variation of the argument I was just making about mm -hmm. complexity in design. And and so I, I think that that one of the things that you that you wrestle with and have to ask is, you know, is there more to our existence in the material world that I can kind of handle? Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think in the long run, the answer to that question, interestingly enough, is deeply rooted in what makes us unique, and that is our ability to think and reason and interact, et cetera, which is not – I mean, I don't think there uh, – I don't think there are chemical things going on between mm -hmm. people who interact. There's something more profound that's going on. And, and to just explain it as a reaction of chemicals is to highly underestimate what's taking place between people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I definitely think the existential questions mm -hmm. are one of the, the things underlying the types of faith conversations that we see in the book and that we you know, see played out across the public square. I also think there might be, a, I don't know, at least for those who are more intellectually driven, um, I think there might be a fear underlying, you know, for people who want to control, want to know. And, and so the questions that can get very detailed, and like mm -hmm. you were talking about, even like in the book, you know, the burden of proof, like mm -hmm. all these different kinds of you know, sophisticated, philosophical, like, back and forth and all of that. But perhaps, I don't know, what would, would you all agree or have you had any experience with people where it seems like there might be actually fear driving mm -hmm. those questions? And what fear does is it tends to move us away from faith. And so, uh, and one of the things that I like about the book, I think I can say this without giving anything away, is that it gives space to the lack of certainty that we sometimes mm -hmm. have, or the 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 role 
of doubt or openness. I'll say it that way to thinking about how you think about what's in front of you. That kind of those categories exist in the conversations, and I think that that is something I don't have to have everything nailed down in order to move out in faith. I don't have to I'll say it this way. This is a little more graphic. I don't have to be or perceive myself as being omniscient in order to function in life, mm-hmm. and so. Um, that seems to me to be um, to be something that is that the people who seek to control what goes around, on around them are really expressing out of their fear an attempt to grasp and get a hold and control that fear. And the best way to control that fear, I think, is to have a, a healthy, mature faith that mm-hmm. trusts in the one who actually is in control. Mm-hmm. So that actually brings up, Dr. Siegel, one of my questions for you was, it seemed like in the book you took care to call caution against 100% surety mm-hmm. in yep. you know, intellectual answers. In, e- in both directions. Yes, right? absolutely. Mm-hmm. In faith or, or a- theism or atheism. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So talk, about, talk to us about that approach. Yeah, I, I think I'm being trying to be honest and wrestle with, um, number one, what motivates faith, what motivates doubt in, in both of the cases, of both characters, Mike Berg, the, the former theologian turned atheist, and Yar, the computer. And at first it looks like Yar is motivated strictly by the facts. He's done all the calculations and concluded Christianity is true. And then you start peeling some things away and you realize even for for it or him, there are other factors, there are other things going on um, that he has experienced and has th- had to think through and face. So um, what I'm trying to do through you know the device of fiction and dialogue is basically paint a picture of what real life is and the, and just be honest with it. There are a lot of things in my life that that have pushed me to Christ and pushed me to faith. Um, and I understand, I try to understand, you know, my, my atheist uncle mm-hmm. who has rejected and the reasons he has rejected, he articulates, uh, they they make sense to me in a mm-hmm. in a at an intellectual level. Uh, I'm doing everything I can to not give away the the you know, no spoiler. Yeah, you're spoiler going alert. Here we go. I'm right at the edge here. Read the book. You got, <laughs> you got to the edge of the file. I did. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. But I think if we're honest, everybody's in that situation. Mm-hmm. We're all in that situation where we're where we're moved back and forth through. We're wavering between certainty and doubt, and I think that's actually kind of close to where it ends. You know, that's where faith is. Uh, we don't have all of the answers and have it, have it all figured out. Mm. Which and that's okay. Which is not always communicated from the In church circles, to yes. the public square, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so that can be something that could be really refreshing, even for mm-hmm. people who are listening that find themselves, like you said, we we all find ourselves mm-hmm. in that space, and to to be able to own that and to say that and say, you know. Yes, there is not 100% surety, but that doesn't mean that there's not a place for faith. That doesn't mean, you know, that that is actually part of the faith journey yep. itself and the release of the fear in faith. And So let me talk about the danger of what it means to try and pursue 100% certainty, because mm-hmm. what it does is it risks shutting down the conversation that we need to have in people who are in a vulnerable place. And so, you know, they don't feel the comfort of being able to raise an issue or a question or a doubt because they feel like, well, I know how you're going to – I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't mm-hmm. have this feeling or reaction that I'm, that I'm coping with on a regular basis, et cetera. We don't create a we, – if we don't create a space for this kind of thinking, then the result is a kind of shutdown that actually isn't healthy. For the for a function of a community of people, many of whom in the same breath will say, well, "We know there are a lot of people broken around us." You can't mm-hmm. have that both ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, uh, so actually, being aware of 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 the kind of space an honest, transparent engagement um, produces is actually one that serves the community at large because that means I can approach someone with what I'm wrestling with. Mm-hmm. And I think this kind of work gives that space, mm-hmm. you know, in a in a unique way. And and so kind of for our final turn of all of the different layers of the conversation that we're we're having as a 
as a result of this. You talked about, you know, through this literary device, mm -hmm. this is what I'm trying to do. So talk to us about your approach to the relationship between um, faith and like in spirituality and like literature and art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's like you said, it's a device, it's a it's a genre. Um the history of the church is riddled with uh religious fictions, <laughs> you know, we call them <laughs> apocrypha or pseudepigraphic writings and things like this where they're they're trying to get across spiritual or moral or sometimes political, social kinds of values and messages and they cast them in the form of some kind of narrative. Um but uh science fiction, you know, this is my fourth um fiction book mm -hmm. I've done. Um, it's, it's a it's a great vehicle because you can get characters to say things that you wish you could say in ways you wish you could say them, you know, and uh, have these discussions. So it's a great way of uh, of studying some of these issues in a way that's engaging, entertaining. I think um, more Christians should do it uh, better than we have. I think mm. uh, the the ending. I'm not going to give away the ending, but the ending. Interesting little fact: there was a 30 second chapter. To the book that kind of served as a wrap-up and tied up things very nice and neat, kind of typical cliche, happy ending thing. And one of my early readers of a draft said, this is great, get rid of the last chapter. Hmm. Leave it open. E leave it open mm -hmm. for reflection discussion. I said, are you serious? I went back and I'm like, he's right. Deleted mm -hmm. the chapter. And now you're kind of, what happens next? In it, and it's that message of we're all one step away from the next step. It's always in this process and in a journey. So I think that that fiction has a way of just illustrating and accentuating things that um, in a way that, no offense, people aren't going to read a lot of the books Daryl and I write yeah. for the scholarly <laughs> audience. They're it's, just another, it's another way in, and it's another mm -hmm. way in that sometimes works around – even defense mechanisms that people mm -hmm. have when you say the word theology, and I, I you know, I, I've got to say, you know, the Bible does this. You've got parables, major vehicle of Jesus yeah. that are that are that are constructed mm -hmm. stories that are designed to illustrate a truth, but to do it not necessarily because its facts are you know bolted down to the ground, but it's the kind of thing that could happen or the kind of thing that someone yeah. could contemplate. You've got it, uh, assuming the short ending of Mark, okay, so there's the there's my little apologetic there coming you go. in. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You've got a very open ended ending to the Gospel of Mark. I've got a resurrection. Now the question is, what are you going to do with it? Yeah. You don't even get appearances in Mark. You just yeah. get the empty tomb. What are you going to do with this? Or the end of Acts, Acts. okay? Mm -hmm. What in the what world next? happened to Paul? Yeah. Okay, all right. Isn't even addressed because I think the book is saying, once the Word of God moved from Jerusalem to Rome, the center of the world at the time, um, God had already done a pretty amazing thing with the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so there are open-ended things that happen. Some of them are grounded in history and some of them aren't. But the point is the way in which, the way in which truth gets framed is mm -hmm. as important as the truth itself. It's a, and they become dialogue starters rather exactly. than dialogue enders. It, the fact, um, I mentioned earlier my atheist, agnostic uncle, he's not a fictional character, he's real. Uh, He's read it. Mm -hmm. He would pick it up. He'll pick this up and read it. He's not going to read my, you know, commentary on Shepherd of Hermes, but he'll read this, right? Mm -hmm. And ask questions, engage with me a little bit about it. So, um, pointed fact. So it is a, a helpful tool. Yeah. So I was going to ask, who was your intended audience for it? Not, not strictly the the unbeliever, the atheist, but um, my primary audience was was a Christian audience. Most, mm -hmm. let's just be honest, most apologetic sources are consumed by Christians. They're the ones who are kind of reading it, and it's um, kind of firming up their faith or giving them uh, tools to engage unbelievers. But it has been in the hands of, of unbelievers or atheists or agnostics, and uh, my goal was to hopefully re represent them in a way that they felt fairly represented, their concerns and questions. Um, but yeah, the primary audience was, was a Christian audience informing them that Atheists aren't stupid. Uh, mm. They have concerns. They have questions. And we can carry on conversations like this. And yet I'm assuming 
that in the dialogues that you have between the two sets of characters that you're trying to help display, at least to a degree, the way in which interactions on these topics should take place. Yeah, yeah. And I think the – I you know, I've, I wrote this fine line between being too preachy because mm-hmm. it wasn't supposed to be just a bunch of apologetic arguments in narrative form, which right. is a, a, a gimmick I don't like. But I also had to make it believable. You got a, a PhD – theologian mm-hmm. and a computer and they have to carry on a conversation at a certain level. Mm-hmm. And how do I worth school of divinity right? no <laughs> less. Yeah. <laughs> Not a real place. <laughs> wink wink. Um, but right, how do you how do you present this story without at my wife, when she read it, she said, I feel like I, I felt like I was in a room and there's some scholars having an argument. I didn't know what they were talking about. Hmm. And that's kind of what I wanted. Mm-hmm. Because it was sort of like the the Clash of the Titans to a degree, but I also had to tone it down because I did want it to be understandable. So it's this, it's a fine line and a very risky endeavor. So um, there's a little bit of that. It's not, I uh, hopefully not overly preaching, teachy, but uh, hopefully the story has enough heart to uh, make that make sense. One of the tensions in Christian media is how explicit to be versus implicit, yeah. and let the yeah. let the observer think about what mm-hmm. they are seeing rather than being told. What yeah. they are seeing, and that's I, I think part of a good artistic skill is the ability to probe a question and to probe a deduction without actually yeah. declaring it. Mm-hmm. And just for the record, uh, what Yar says in his arguments and statements are not necessarily my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> just that it's little just a device. <laughs> Gonna bar Spiegel from the Yar. <laughs> so one last question before we run out of time fully is what surprised you at the end of the project? Like after you did it, is there anything that you were like, hmm. huh? Like I didn't really see that either coming in the narrative or in the feedback or just in your own reflections, what surprised you? Yeah, that's interesting that you asked that question because uh, I think people who have never written you know, fiction don't realize that uh, your characters start to kind of take on a life of their own. They do and they say things that, that even the writer as they're going don't quite expect. It's a weird dynamic, but but everybody talks about it. So I would say, um, what surprised me? That's a great question. Um, I guess I'm a little bit surprised at the end at how, uh, even with the original ending, how unresolved it was to a certain degree. Uh, I was kind of in the front end thinking that eventually, eventually they're going to get to the bottom of the paper and have the answer. Mm. And... Uh, I like where it where it landed. You got to the bottom of the paper and you ran out of paper. Mm-hmm. Is that's life, mm-hmm. You're right? Maybe you turn the page and you keep writing, but it's. Um, I, I think we have to be happy with a little bit of lack of total resolution, and I think that that's another one of the themes there. What I found interesting is I was asking myself, so which of these two approaches to life would I prefer to adopt? Hmm. And um, and I think I think I found myself on the side of the machine. (laughs) (laughs) You know, (laughs) you know, and and so you know, maybe the artificial intelligence isn't so artificially intelligent after all. Uh, And and so um, and I think that's actually could be one of the ways the 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 probing way that you went about this uh, actually functions. So hopefully, those of you who are listening have had your in, your curiosity peaked uh, as we've been talking through this. And like we said, it is a really good, nice, quick read. It would be wonderful to do over a weekend or something like that. And But it's very layered, like we've said, and it is thoughtful and it engages a lot of different dimensions of our faith and our current cultural context and all of that. So Dr. Siegel, thank you for being here. Thank you for putting the time in for this work in general. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, they can get it on Amazon, ebook, print. <laughs> it also has an audible uh, uh, audiobook version. The last awesome. minute was presented to you by DTS professors <laughs> on behalf of literature. <laughs> awesome. Well appreciate Darryl, it. Thank you for the of course, conversation. Of mm-hmm. course. And Daryl, thank you as yeah, always yeah, for joining welcome. and sure. actually just letting me sit at this table. So <laughs> 
Um, and we just want to thank you who are listening. And we ask that you would be sure to join us next time as we discuss issues of God and culture. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.